Welcome to Dentology, the Business of Dentistry podcast. In this podcast, we delve into the non-clinical aspects of dentistry with inspirational guests from across the profession. You will hear incredible life stories, pick up valuable business tips and be entertained. I'm Andy Acton and I'm joined by my co-host, Chris Drevens. People's life stories, it just, every time it gets me. No, it it's really fascinating, does. isn't it? You know, yet another guy that really, um, the, the things that we learnt about him, um, people won't know, especially that last bit with his, his granddad. I thought that was interesting because he mm. hasn't really shared that with many people. No. And, and lo and behold, we spoke in Chinfano for 40 odd minutes and there he yeah. is sharing it at the end of it. But it's I also find it intriguing that when you understand more about the person and then you look at the business they have and what they do, you get a, a much deeper understanding of why it's important to them and mm. why they care about what they do and what they do for their clients. Yeah, no, definitely. It was, it was, it was, he's a good lad. It's yeah. Good lad. An interesting business as well. Absolutely. No, it was a really interesting conversation with Eric. So today, uh, we're very happy. We're joined by the founder of Ignite Growth, which is a healthcare marketing agency that specializes in attracting patients for high value treatments. And that person is Derek Uttenbrook. Yeah. Welcome to Derek. How are you doing? Yeah, very good, guys. Thank you so much for having me. No, thank you very much very indeed. Good to be here. No, pleasure. Um, and we appreciate your patience. We've had technical problems this morning, haven't we? We have. It's been a bit of a... It's nothing to do with us. We hate to say No, that. no, no. So, yeah, we, <laughs> we appreciate your patience. So, thank you very much indeed. And I must admit, we were just admiring your workspace behind you. It is very funky and cool. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a, it's a, it's not a Zoom background. It's a real background. Um, and yeah, it's a little co-working space in Northwest London where I'm based just, you know, about 20 minutes walk from home really. So yeah, it's like a, this is my den. This is my man cave. Your man cool. cave. So um, that means there's, there's probably the, a snooker table then, is there somewhere? Uh, just, just off screen. Yeah, yeah, just a, absolutely. <laughs> just, that's over there. Absolutely. And a massive great um, TV to watch sport. <laughs> absolutely. So it's, it's all here in, in my, in my tiny loft uh, man cave. No, but it's, it's, it's a very important space to me, um, you know, uh, 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 well, well, we'll get into that later, but I think focus as a business owner is so important. And I think, mm. you know, your environment is, is extremely important. Um, and so I've learned that over the years after working from different places. And now for me, it's, it's non-negotiable. I don't have a man cave at home. So this is my man cave. Yeah. I think my bass guitar is going to make an appearance here at some point. Oh, well, well. okay. So, yeah. Yeah, it's I, good to have delineation, I think, between an office space and a work. For me personally, I'm the same. It's quite good to uh, not just sit there at the kitchen table or mm. whatever it is, because otherwise it all gets a bit uh, in my head. I sort of, if I'm sitting in the office at home, I'm focused on what I'm doing at home. And when I'm in the office here, I'm focused on that. Um, yeah, that's what I, I, I like delineation. I think. Yeah, I must admit, I, I think that working above the shop must always be quite difficult where literally there's there's no separation at all and for lots of people home working was just that yeah one. you gotta feel sorry for them when you know you go out to the days of covid you used to see those pictures of you know couples who lived in a one bed flat yeah, hard, with no absolutely. balcony and you know one person was working in the bedroom and one person was sitting at the counter or whatever you know the kitchen yeah, counter yeah. And you absolutely just flip. that must have been a nightmare really we were so well, i'm sure like productivity and output must have massively dropped. And I think quite a few studies have been done about the impact of switching um, contexts. Right. Mm. Um, like using, like switching between different contexts and uh, how inefficient that is in terms mm. of actually completing any one thing. Um, and so, I mean, it's worse now than ever, right? With like your phone buzzing and yeah. like, Slack message and this and WhatsApp and whatever. So we're constantly switching contexts, which is, you know, I find that, that that's a battle that you constantly have to fight to try and mm. get yeah. that focus. I think one study I saw, it can take up to 22 minutes to get back into focus, to get back yeah, into yeah, yeah, yeah. the thing that you were really deep in. It can take 22 minutes. So if somebody keeps interrupting you on going through the day, you never get to that deep focus mm. on, on, on the thing that you're really no. trying to get done. I think especially with numbers sometimes, you know, when we're working on numbers, mm. it's like, oh, look, please don't interrupt me again because I've now got to go back and try and remember where yeah. I was in this process. Yeah. So do you, it's a specialist subject to you today, Derek. And, and to start with, you're, you're like a world of nations in one body, aren't you? Because you're, <laughs> you're, 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 you're fully Dutch. You say you've moved around a lot. You're fully Dutch? Fully Dutch. That's Derek's own touch. Oh, really? Own oh, it's oh, not, oh, it's okay. not half Dutch or quarter Dutch. It's fully, it's fully Dutch. Dutch. Right. And you've lived, in the, Dutch. you've lived in the Netherlands, the US, the UK, Malaysia. Uh, your wife is Indian, but born and raised in Japan. There's a, yeah, lot, yeah, there's yeah. a lot going on there. Oh, there's any, a lot going on there. Any African, yeah, no. any African countries in there? Or we sort of like managed to not avoid yet, Africa. Not yet. Oh, okay. Not, Africa not yet. and South um, America, be sorted. I love the well, positivity yeah. of not yet. It's, it's, not yet it's, absolutely. It, it's always a journey, isn't it? I mean, the world's your oyster, right? So, no, yeah. I mean, um, 
I guess growing up in different places has, has been kind of a key part of, of, of my background, really. Um, I left uh, Holland when I was nine. We moved to the US, lived there for a couple of years, didn't speak any English at the time. So we had to, I had to learn that, my, me and my brother. And then lived in the UK um, for a couple of years. And after that, I did most of my secondary school in Malaysia, in Penang. Uh, oh, so I don't wow. know if you guys have ever hmm. visited Penang, but it's an amazing place. And um, so a lot of my formative years were out there. And then moved back to London, um, or back to the UK rather, in 2005. So yeah, it's been, you know, a, a kind of a key part of, of that. And my wife and I have two kids now, and they're, so they're half Dutch, half Indian, but not really half Dutch and half Indian. If you, well, they're, yeah. they're British, um, but, you know, they use some Japanese words as well. So I was going to say, what, what languages ways. can you speak? Can you speak so I, I just speak, no, I just speak Dutch and, and, and English. I mean, in Malaysia, they speak Malay mm. um, and Chinese and the Indian community speaks a lot of Tamil, uh, but everyone speaks English. Right. So it, I never really learned the language properly because I didn't have to, but um, yeah, mm. Dutch, and, Dutch and English. My wife speaks English, Hindi and, and Japanese. Wow. Um, which, yeah, so it's a bit of a mixed bag. Mm. We are lucky, aren't we, speaking English, really, because we are just oh, we're spoiled. so lazy. We're spoiled. Did you yeah. see that thing with the French government or something? It's trying to remove, it's going to fine people if they put English words in communications and the business communication. So <laughs> wow. If you use an English word, it's going to be a Euro fine because they said they're, they're fed up with the Anglica, Anglicization of uh, of the world. I thought it's so typically French, uh, really. Uh, years, <laughs> years, 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 ago, years ago in a previous life, I worked for a Danish <laughs> bank and one of the guys there told me that in Denmark, any TV program that's broadcast can only be by law broadcast in the language it was made in. Which is why Danes oh. tend to be so good at English, because obviously there are lots of programs are, 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 are in the English language, lots of them coming from America. And they're saying that's yeah, almost part of their curriculum to help people learn English, wow. in that it has to be broadcast in the, in the language that, it, that uh. it was made in, which actually is quite smart mm. because it's just kind of this, this nationwide um, education program for people Absolutely. to learn English, which was, which was quite, quite clever. It's quite yeah, interesting. I'm oh, sorry, I was going to say with you, Derek, that you learn English in the US, because I've known some people who've learned. US in Germany, but they learnt it on US Army bases. Right. And they speak with an American accent, which really is quite freaky. <laughs> they're German people who speak with an American accent. Uh, so I'm sort funny, of surprised yeah. in a way. If you if you've learnt your language in, in it obviously wasn't long enough for you to end up with an American tat twang so, in your voice. So it's kind of weird because I, I used to have an American accent, but then, uh, you know, and then I when I moved away and, and lived here, I actually went to an American school in, in the UK. Um and then I, when we lived in Malaysia, I, I think the accent, there's kind of an international accent. So when you go to international schools, there's like a blend, a mm. blended accent, which is kind of, it's not British or South African or Kiwi or anything like that. So people kind of think, oh, it, it sounds American or Canadian mm. uh, because, you know, the way we roll ours and stuff. But yeah, so I think I had that. But then the, the longer I've been here in the UK, you tend to emulate the people you're around, right? Mm. To be understood and to use yeah. language of people that you're around. So I think I've I've kind of adapted um, over the years, so it's a bit of a mixed bag. But mm. my, my my the kids sound proper proper British. Yeah. <laughs> Given how much there was going on in your in your childhood, is there a moment that you can look back on in your childhood and kind of say that was a, a defining moment in your life that's kind of put you on the path to where you are now? Yeah, whether good or bad. I was going to say there were so many experiences you must have had as a, as a younger person. Yeah, it's a good question. So I think w when we first moved to the US, it, it was it was vastly different. So my brother and I didn't speak any English to start with. And we went to a, um, a a public American middle school at the time. And we, because the education standards in Holland were different to the US, we, we, had, we actually got bumped a year. So I was the youngest in the entire year. It was a huge school. And it was a typical kind of like um, middle high school like the American middle school, high school experience that you kind of see in the movies with the, with the rows of lockers and you have like the geeks and the nerds and the skaters right, and okay. everything else. And so, so are you trying you know, to be Danny Zuko, were you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, so I, um, you know, it was a very different environment. I came from a very small school in a, in a town of, you know, 3,000 people. So my, oh, I think wow. I had maybe 15, 20 kids in my year. Mm. All of a sudden I'm in this massive school, um, moving between classrooms and all this kind of stuff. And, so for us, that was a huge experience. It was really difficult. It's um, a massive culture shock. Absolutely. And in the first year, we, you know, to be honest, I didn't really have any friends. Um, and it was just really tough. It was tough at home because we were all kind of getting used to it. My parents were like, oh, we moved out here because of my dad's job. And it was a great opportunity. But they were like, what have we done? But it's so <laughs> tough. And the kids mm -hmm. and this and that. And yeah, I think that that was probably a, a defining period 
uh, because it brought us really close as a family. And we kind of battled through it together. And then in the second year, we spoke English, started making friends and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that was definitely a defining period. And after that, every single move we've done has just become easier and easier and easier and easier uh, because you get comfortable with change. Mm. And so I think that that is definitely um, that, that, that resilience that, that I think I developed during that time is, is helpful because mm. as a small business, you, you have to constantly change and yeah. adapt, right? As you know. And so you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, mm. I think. And you learned that skill early, which has, has also set you up well. Because like you say, if you, if you can get comfortable with change, then you're prepared mm. to, to try things and accept that there's no kind of static situation. You're always going to be in a, in a state of flow. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, I mean, definitely looking back at it, I think that that was a defining feature of, of my childhood. Um, and there are specific moments in that where, you know, um, I got called to the school office because they found my brother who was two years older than I am uh, and someone who I obviously looked up to mm -hmm. as a child and still do. And they, f they found him crying because he was lost um, oh. and he was alone and he was just sitting in the hallway and all the classes were uh, filled and it was completely empty. He was alone. And then they kind of called me to like figure out what's going on. So I was like, oh, wow, my brother, like he, he's, he's meant to be the guy who was mm -hmm. kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, big tough um, guy. Then, yeah blazing the trail and all that kind of stuff so yeah there were some defining moments that were were really tough um i remember my parents dropped us off at school my dad dropped us off and he said well i can't molly coddle these guys they have to it's going to be a tough shit day for them mm -hmm. excuse me i'm sorry i love swear but um it's, it's, it's not my teacher fine doing no fine so uh a crap day for them and so they but he knew he had to rip off the band-aid so he kind of stopped the car and said okay guys off you go and he kind of drove off fighting, fighting the tears whilst he's looking in his rearview mirror, like leaving us behind on the wow. pavement outside school. So, you know, there's some really defining moments there. But, you know, overall, it's, it's made us really close as a family, very mm. strong, resilient. Um, you know, absolutely, yeah. Mm. And then you decided to do your, your business studies um, in the UK back in 2008. Um, you actually went to King's College London, which is also very I well did. known for dentistry as well. So mm. did that... Did, did that start to put you in touch with aspiring dentists and did that give you an insight to that world or was that just a coincidence? You know what? I, I wish it, it did. Um, it didn't really, but I, I, I did know quite a few dentists and medics mm. and, um, you know, they were actually always the ones that, that drank the most, drank the most and partied the hardest and, and smoked the most and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's another story. I mean, Guy's Campus had a McDonald's on it. I don't know if it still does, but <laughs> at the time it had a McDonald's on it, which says a lot because that was like the medical, the medical campus. But, um, no, but, but I, I ran the Entrepreneurial and Investment Society mm. there because I'd always kind of wanted to start my own business and, and whatnot. But, I, you know, of the uh, clinical people that I met or the people who were, who were you know, doing clinical courses, I, I did realize that there was a huge difference in terms of, a, you know, um, a gap in that kind of business knowledge and, and business, mm -hmm. you know, uh, interest or, or, or commercial, commercial awareness. Mm. And so I think it definitely planted a seed. Um, and I, I like to use it. Now, when someone asks me, oh, where did you say, oh, King's College? I think, oh, great. Yeah, you know, that validates my position in the industry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Gives so, you authority. Yeah, but no, I decided to come to London. Uh, actually, I wanted to go to Sydney uh, to study for university. But my dad was like, oh, if you move to Sydney, you're never going to leave Australia. So go to London first. You can always move to Sydney at some point. And I think he was right. So uh, I applied to the UK, got accepted in the King's. And, and, and there I was, basically, yeah. Brilliant. But then you chose, you, you obviously didn't move straight into the business that you own now or even dentistry you went into into banking uh, was that was yeah, that absolutely. was that was that in the city the city of london banking yeah it was in the right. city yeah absolutely so i graduated in 2008 um it's great timing uh yes. yeah, yeah, good time, yeah. <laughs> did an internship with the company before so it was a financial services firm and basically uh started my job in i think on the first of september or second of september oh, wow. 2008. so layman brothers yeah, yeah. went down yeah. was it is october yeah. november yeah. 2008. yeah it, it was like in the first couple yeah. of weeks yeah it was crazy and so we were um you know, we uh, my job was to help sell and promote. Um, <laughs> we're just laughing because Sorry, we're just... time means everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to, jo yeah, to, to join banking, I've before, got, I've got, got my before. new job as a mortgage broker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> just yeah. before the, it's like the <laughs> biggest global <laughs> banking crisis in, in yeah, since ever. ever. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, exactly. It was it was really poor timing, but it was you know what? It was a great. Um, I, I got a job offer, and it was a great job, mm. and, and I was trying to get into like the big investment banks because yep. you know they were all kind of recruiting and courting us from from these universities and these big fairs and giving us free stuff so you know that was the place to be basically like mm. now everyone's going into tech but then everyone wants to get into banking so i was one mm. of those 
people. And then, so I got this job offer. It was a great, great job offer. I did an internship with them. And then, so I graduated in September 2008, um, or started with them rather. And then, so my job was to sell and promote um, venture capital trusts mm. and enterprise investment schemes. And, and you know, I, I'm sure you guys know what they are, but I think for anyone who's listening that doesn't, they are high risk investments yeah. that you get lots of tax breaks on. But they're very high risk investments. I mean, they, they are, you're probably going to lose your money uh, mm. and then the tax breaks kind of ease the pain. But if they do well, then, you know, great, you get a little tax free return. So, uh, you know, my job was ringing up financial advisors and saying, do any of your clients want an EIS scheme or this and that? And this is like, they're like, sorry, Lehman Brothers just went bust last week. Like, I, you know, we're, we're in free fall mode. Yeah. Like, we're not going to be buying your stuff. We're you know? running like, for the hills. Mm. Absolutely. So it was, it was chaos. Um, but I was there for a couple of years. I learned a lot. We worked with a, I worked with a lot of different types of businesses. I mean, the nature of what we did was helping small businesses raise money, mm -hmm. basically, through EIS and VCT schemes. And so I think that's where I really developed a passion for working with, with smaller, smaller businesses mm -hmm. um, and learned a lot about the economics of that, what that looks like. And, and, and I think it helped me establish a kind of core commercial awareness. Um, so, yeah, no, that, that, but yeah, not, not great timing as far as City goes. Then I left and I went to Accenture uh, huh, where I worked okay. as a consultant. Mm. I did that for a few years and I worked uh, in some of the large banks in, in, in the UK. So uh, I, I worked on the post-merger integration of um, HBOS and, and Lloyd's but. <laughs> um, when, when, when LBG took over HBOS. Um, so I did that for a couple of years. I was up in sunny Halifax um, in, in Yorkshire. And um, yeah, I mean, that was a great kind of big corporate experience. Mm. Um, I later then moved on to Santander, worked in that corporate bank. Uh, I think they were, at the time, they were acquiring a, a piece of uh, RBS. So yeah, lots of different experience. I mean, I think Accenture gave me more project management experience, uh, process improvement, gave me a better understanding of like looking top down at mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. larger corporate business and understanding the different functions and how, how they all interact. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. And but, then, whether it felt like this for you at the time, but you seem to have a really positive outlook and... and positive memories of what would have been a difficult period which i think says quite a lot about you because it would have been hard to yeah we, we laugh about it but you joined the banking sector in late 2008 what wasn't much fun at all but you the way you recount it you've taken a lot of positives from that experience and out of adversity well, i yeah. think it's that great yeah. thing of sometimes it, those are real learning moments aren't they when things aren't very easy mm. well no i mean you're right i think to some extent i probably didn't know any better because i had a I had a great job offer from like a top 25 financial services firm in the UK. The salary was good. Uh, I was living in central London, just enjoying life basically. Mm. And it was hard, but I never knew any better. I mean, I never, you know, I never did the, the, the I, I never had the good old days of bonuses and mm. going golfing and this and that. Like I, I, I never knew that. And so everyone else around me that had more gray hairs knew that, but I never knew that. So mm. for me, it was just, yeah, it's a tough time and, and I'm not going to get a bonus or whatever, but it's, this is life. Like, let me just soak it up and learn. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, it, it was, it was kind of okay. Mm. And then from that, of course, like, you know, uh, when I went to Accenture, they, uh, these consultancies always clean up, right? Because when there's mergers and consolidations and stuff like that's when the consultants get shipped in. And so Accenture grew massively. So then the recession was a, a career opportunity for me mm -hmm. um, yeah. to then, you know, establish myself at Accenture and, and grow and get promoted and all that mm. kind of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, honestly, I think it's very easy to point fingers at inflation, recession, this and that. But like at the end of the day, you are the architect of your own yeah. destiny to some degree, right? Yeah. And so people make money in downturns as well. It's just mm -hmm. how you position yourself and what you do and, and taking ownership and control of that mm -hmm. to some mm -hmm. degree. And then control your bit, control yeah, exactly. your controllable. Yeah, yeah, yeah the exactly. You can't do. Exactly. And then jump forward to 2017, you then started Ignite. Can you remember the moment? when when you decided that that's what you're going to do was was there a kind of a, a a specific moment in time when it really did hit you that this was your going to be your future you know what so so uh, after accenture i started my own business which was a crowdfunding platform and i i raised investment for that and after about 18 months or so i ended up selling that it kind of washed its face it wasn't a massive success but i learned a lot then i was working at santander as a contractor did that for a couple of years and i was very comfortable uh, I was making a really good day rate. That's a really, uh, that's a really I, unpleasant place to be, though, isn't it? 
very comfortable is a hard place to be. Well, well, that's the thing, right? And I was comfortable and I was like the first person on the project. And by the end of it, there was like a hundred people on the project. So I was like the go-to SME who'd been there since the beginning and you just accumulate like mm -hmm. knowledge and, and contacts and stuff. So I would, have, I would have never walked away from that because it was comfortable and whatever. Um, and then they scrapped the project. And of course, uh, contractors are the first to go. Mm -hmm. And so two weeks before my daughter was born, I they said, okay, thank you very much. We, we don't need you anymore. And actually... For me, that was amazing because, you know, there was these golden handcuffs I felt that that I was able to, they were just taken away from me. Mm -hmm. and I'm, It would have been hard to take that step voluntarily, but mm -hmm. then I found myself without any work. It was you know, almost done for of, you, wasn't it? Absolutely. But I, and my colleagues and stuff were panicking, but by that time I'd put some money away and saved some money. I was like, you know what? My daughter's going to be born in two weeks. Um, I'm going to enjoy this. So I took nine months off uh, as, as paternity leave. Uh, lived on, on savings, supported the family through savings. And in that time, I was like, well, there's got to be a better way to make a living um, than working at a bank as a contractor. Uh, you know, it, 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 I knew what I was doing. I was comfortable in that space, but wasn't that challenging. wasn't that interesting. And I always wanted to kind of create a business that I could architect my life around mm -hmm. um, or architect around my life even. Uh, and, and, you know, as you guys know, I think everything changes when you have kids, right? Priorities change. And yeah. so for me, that was like a really interesting time to pivot. And so that's when Ignite was, was born. I was like, oh, well, Facebook ads are kind of picking up for small businesses. It's kind of becoming a thing. Mm -hmm. Let me learn how to run Facebook ads. And then if I can help attract, you know, customers for a business, then there's value in that for the right kind of business. And that's, that's basically how I got started. I did a course on Facebook ads and like all those guys at the moment in the Facebook groups who are saying, oh, can I work with a practice for free and give you a testimonial, this and that. I was one of those guys and I started right at the beginning with zero clients. Um, and yeah, the, the rest is kind of history really. So mm. that was for me the, mm. the point. Brilliant. So, wow. so, so just for those that don't know, can you kind of just talk us through what is it that Ignite can do for dental practices? Yeah, sure. And so in a nutshell, um, we help attract uh, patients for specific high value treatments. Um, so we do that using uh, primarily using social media advertising and search engine advertising. So we run Facebook ads, Instagram ads, and Google ads uh, for specific treatments uh, to basically get people yeah, booked in and, and, and going ahead with treatment. So yeah, it's it's um, it's definitely a cutthroat business. You know, <laughs> we, we have to keep producing leads every month. Um, but yeah, we have about 100 or so clinics across the UK that we work with. We, we operate in about 65% of the UK's postcodes. Brilliant. Um, wow. And yeah, no, it's, it's, been, it's been a hell of a journey. Mm. Uh, out, the last of, out of interest, six, Derek, on the, out of your 100 clients, and uh, I'm assuming then by the sounds of things, you're, sim uh, you're promoting similar types of treatments. Do you have to adapt a message for a geography? You, you do to some degree. So it, it kind of depends. So we, we try to find a balance between what we know works and what and how we adapt to the kind of the brand mm -hmm. and the messaging of, of the of the clinic, if that makes sense. Mm. So, you know, I think that sometimes people try to kind of steer the ads in the direction of a certain brand image or what they want to portray like i want to portray myself as a premium practice and we don't we don't call it you know we don't want to call it a free consultation we want to call it a complimentary consultation we try to factor that stuff into mm -hmm. the ads but we also have to balance that with well actually this is what works and this is what doesn't work and an extreme example of that is you know sometimes practices are like well when when leads come through they don't really have an understanding of price for something like invisalign can we tell people it's starting from 3,895 pounds in the ad? And we're like, well, yes, you can, but that's kind of going in quite strong with the lead. Someone yeah. who doesn't know you, they don't know what you're about. They don't know what you can do for mm -hmm. them. And so we always have to kind of find a balance and advise people, well, we can do that, but your results are going to suffer. And it, mm. this is what works mm. versus that. So mm. we, we try to strike a balance basically. Mm. Um, what works very well is like, using copy that resonates with the local area. So if there's specific yeah. okay. like, landmarks in the area that you can make references to, or even if you can potentially call out the area or the people in the area or make some sort of, you know, people in Kentish town are often upset with their smile, blah, 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 blah. Then it helps attract to the, to the subconscious because right. we have okay. to appeal to the subconscious, right? Because right. you're, on, you're on Facebook, you're scrolling, you're scrolling down mm. your feed and it's actually your subconscious, which is, telling your your conscious mind to, mm. to stop scrolling and look at something and so 
by making the ad more relative uh, relevant to your to your prospect um no, you're, you're, you're mm. to someone's subconscious. since since 2017 has there been much change in patient buying requirements and have those those messages that they respond well to mm. evolved as well are we becoming mm. more sophisticated as, as prospective um, patients it's a great question actually i think i think in the more competitive areas definitely so in central London, it's very, very competitive. And what we find is that, especially with treatments like Invisalign, which are, dare I say, a little bit more commoditized to the consumer, like it seems like a more commoditized product than something like dental surgery or implants, um, you know, people hop from consultation to consultation because they know that Bob Dental down the road offers free whitening and free composite bonding. Um, and so they they hop around mm. from consultation to consultation to try and get, you know, the, the best, best quote. So it, it does... Um, it has evolved. I think in less competitive areas, more rural settings, smaller cities, smaller towns, it's, you know, there's a lot of people who still haven't heard of Invisalign or they haven't really gone to a practice to have a consultation, this and that. So uh, yes and no. I mean, there are certain things that work really well. Mm. So, you know, something like a free consultation and scan, it worked in 2017 and it works now. Yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, Practices don't have to do a discount. Everyone thinks, oh, I have to offer 500 pounds off Invisalign. How am I going to make the economics work? You don't have to. For some, for, for big ticket treatments, Interesting. The, the, you know, the, the opportunity to speak to an expert about who can address your concerns is, is valuable enough, right? And so if people perceive us as, as someone who, who knows what we're doing when it comes to attracting patients, then you know, I, I don't have to give a discount on our services. Mm. Because actually, for someone having a call with us, being able to get some advice, pick our brain, or consume our content, they see value in that one. Mm. Too, right? So, yeah. Uh, but uh, there are certain core things that work, basically. Mm. Um, things like, you know, I think one thing that dentists have historically not been great at, but are getting better at, are articulating the is articulating the value mm. of what they offer. Mm. So I think a lot of practices will bundle in free whitening, free retainers, free consultation, a scan with the Invisalign package, but then they won't talk about the opportunity cost of that. You know, if you're if you're doing a thirty minute consultation and scan, what is the what's the opportunity cost of your time mm. as, a, as a dental professional? Mm. It's expensive. You could be treating someone else. You could be placing an implant or what, whatever it is, right? And so people say free consultation, but you know, a consumer might not understand how much that's worth or how valuable that is. Mm. I think that's somewhere where I think dental practices can can improve mm. um, checkups like. If you if you stop someone on the street and you ask them, you know, when when is the last time your dentist like screened you for oral cancer, they wouldn't have a bloody clue, mm-hmm. even if they went for a checkup last week. So I think dentists can do a better job of articulating the value of the things that they mm-hmm. do. Um, and I think we we've seen that improve over time, but I think there's a lot of work to be done there still. This episode is brought to you with our charity partner, Wells on Wheels. Did you know that many girls in Indian villages miss out on education because they have to spend hours fetching water for their families? Wells on Wheels is changing that with the water wheel invention. A water wheel is a rollable drum that can carry five times as much water as a single bucket, making it easier for adults to collect more water in a single trip without risking injury and freeing up young girls from never having to collect water again. With the help of Wells on Wheels, over 2,000 girls are now attending school regularly. Join the cause and help the lives of ambitious girls today. For just £28, a water wheel can transform their futures immediately. Learn more and donate at wellsonwheels.co.uk. Now back to the episode. Yeah, hmm. you mentioned Invisalign a couple of times and you know, Invisalign more broadly, clear aligners. <laughs> that, we've seen massive growth in that. You know, obviously part of our business is, is valuing dental practices. So we've seen those those numbers coming through. Is that is that likely to burst that 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 bubble would it, would it deflate would it continue to be a great practice builder and what, what, what's your view on that that sort of well, size of the market so invisalign has been a huge part of of, of, of us mm. uh, of ignite i mean I, I think out of the 100 practices we work with I pro- I probably about 80 percent of them we, we do some sort of clear line of marketing yeah. ortho marketing for them and so it's a massive part of uh, we've grown we're we're like if 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 a lion is this massive whale, we're like a little feeder fish like <laughs> eating the algae on on its side, right? And 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 we've gotten fatter and fatter as we've eaten more algae. And so, I, I think aligners, clear aligners as a category, will continue to grow. Yeah. Um, I think the what we've experienced is is growth in that in that category of product, mm. in the same way that like I don't know, um, 
you know, I can't even think of a good example, but like, let's say electric cars, mm -hmm. right? That's a good example. Like five, 10 years ago, there were electric cars, but it was not common. It was a mm -hmm. small category. And now, you know, and then Tesla kind of trailblazed the whole thing. And then now it's a bigger category yeah. and, mm -hmm. and the, the market as a whole is, 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 is grown. So I think, um, I don't think it'll burst. But what we are obviously seeing is with the with the aligned patents having expired some time ago or some of the key ones, we are seeing that it's becoming more fragmented. There's challenger brands mm. um, that are disrupting the space. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think that's healthy, healthy competition. But, you know, Invisalign is doing what like Hoover did with, with yeah, their yeah, yeah. stuff, right? With their, uh, or Sellotape or, or countless of examples like that where they are known as the category, yeah. right? They own the word, um, don't they? I mean, that's why lots of dental practices are keen to have that word. They want Invisalign on their banner. And the their branding their and, and their promotion. Yeah, yeah because definitely. patients, they, they actually ask for Invisalign. What they actually mean yeah. is, you know, they're, they're looking for a clear aligner solution. And Invisalign might be the best one for them, but they don't necessarily know that. But mm. credit to yeah. Invisalign, the amount of money they've spent yeah, to, to get themselves into well. that position. They, they own that word. They, they've done a great job. But, but even they are now kind of moving more towards restorative dentistry. If you look at some of the narrative around the iTero scanner, mm -hmm. They are now saying, well, listen, it's not just a fancy before and after tool and a 3D scanning tool. It's actually also great for restorative dentistry. And they're pushing that agenda now as mm. well. And so I think they're moving away from kind of like, you know, being a single uh, product company, only yeah. to more holistic planning around, you know, the, the, the symmetry makes of sense, the face it, and the smile yeah. and that kind of makes stuff. Makes sense. Like yeah. Dyson, wasn't it? Dyson did Hoover's or oh. ah, there you go. Dyson did that <laughs> things, and now they do yeah. hair straighteners. Um, oh yeah. Hair dryers, which cost a fortune, but you know that's yeah, where they yeah, sort of they do. I, I just I just bought one for my for my wife. For my <laughs> yes, they do cost a fortune. They do. Like cost a lot. I'm sure Klarna or whoever it is appears <laughs> next to their. But it's quite interesting. Price. I saw yeah. Shark, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know Shark, which is oh, like an American yeah, brand. Yeah, yeah. They've also now introduced um, like grooming products, curly hairs, and it's quite interesting how they followed mm. the the diversification of Dyson. I thought well, that's interesting. Yeah, interesting. So, as a team, Derek, you as, as Ignite, your your core skill is attracting patients. So you can attract patients to go to dental practices. What are dental practices like at nurturing those opportunities? Because you can be as good as you like. You can get the phone to ring, the website to <laughs> yeah, click, yeah, people to, to walk them, yeah. through that that door, but. But are practices good at, at harnessing those those opportunities or as good as they could be? Well, you know, it's, it's a really interesting point. So I think this is like the eternal... Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> <It's> inherent... <laughs> it's probably the answer. <laughs> well, no, listen, it's, it's very easy for us to point the finger at a practice and say, you're not converting the leads. It's very easy for them to point the finger at us and say, the leads you're generating are crap quality. Mm. And so I think that there is an, an inherent friction in that relationship. Mm. And so like it only really works well where we both see the value in what the other person brings to the party and we need them to convert as much as they need us to generate the inquiries. And so where our relationship is 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 based on trust and where we have a strong understanding and it's a partnership, it does work really well because we can share the tips and advice that we've accumulated over the years with them. Mm. And if they implement that, then generally they will they will see a really good result. But I think you know, dental practices are, they have so much stuff going on. They might not have a dedicated member of staff for this. They might give it to the receptionist yeah. who maybe has been there for 25 mm -hmm. years. There's NHS patients standing at the desk. They're taking card payments. The phone is ringing and then they get lead notifications yeah, from us. And we're saying, yeah. ring that lead within 10 seconds. Yeah. Otherwise, they're not going to convert to treatment. So it, it's a really difficult balance to strike. Um, you know, there is constant improvement that can be done. But I mean, th that is... I would say that is the single most important thing. That is the Achilles heel of this of of the entire um, process and the campaign. Because yes, you can we can generate leads. If those leads are not converted, then what's the point? And and, and no one makes anything. We're all happy, right? So I think one of the we realized quite early on that we needed to help practices with mm. this. And this is back in 2017. And I remember we were working with two practices at the time. We were tiny, and one was doing really well. One was saying, oh, you know, people aren't answering the phone. People are not showing up. They're not coming in. Excuse me. And so we're like, well, what's going on? They're very similar practices, different locations, similar practices, similar demographic, both great at what, what they do in, in kind of affluent areas or whatever. So we're like, well, what's going on? Why, is, why are these guys saying well, we're getting four, five, six cases a month? And these guys are saying we haven't converted a single case. So we're like, you know what? We'll do the follow-up for you. Let, let Just if, if you're okay with that, we will use your practice name and we'll say, you know, I'm so-and-so calling on behalf of ABC Dental. They're like, yeah, yeah, fine, do that. So we got access to their system and all this kind of stuff. And 
we started following up with the patients ourselves and we texted them and we called them and this and that. And, and we learned the ropes and then we were able to um, turn around the success of that campaign by showing them actually it can be done. But how you interact with these people is probably different to what you're used to. Mm. It's not a recall. These people are not warm. They're not word of mouth referrals. Mm. They haven't been on mm. your website. They haven't checked out your fees. They don't know who you are. So yeah. you can't just be like, send them one email and expect them to book in and come in. Mm. You've got to you've got to meet them where they are at. And where they are at is often text message, WhatsApp. You know, for something like Invisalign, you're talking women between 20 and 45 mm. who are busy. Yeah. And they, they prefer to communicate asynchronously mm. um, and so we figured that out quite early on and so we 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 have a team of account managers that kind of interface with practices uh, every practice gets a dedicated account manager and a lot of their time is spent on hand-holding practices on well this is how you follow up this is what you say this is what you don't say um, you know we will routinely kind of check what kind of messages they're sending out how quickly they're contacting patients and mm. so forth so we help them and where that relationship works, it works really well and, and people will get a, you know, a great ROI. I think things are evolving. And I, I mentioned earlier in this uh, podcast that you know, as a business owner, you have to constantly change. And so we are now moving towards a model um, where we are going deeper into that relationship and we're exploring, we're not quite there yet. We've done some pilots, some testing. Mm. We're basically exploring a model where we say to practices, don't worry, we will take care mm. of it. You you just see the patient. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, and so that is a next step. And then we want to get to a point where we say, you just see the patient, you only pay us when they go ahead. Yeah. Mm. Um, that's where we'd really like to get to because then not only are we adding more value to the practice, we're de-risking the process for them. Because yeah. I can go okay. to you and say, Chris or Andy, I can say, listen, you do what you do best, sit in surgery, you know, and, and talk to these patients, identify their needs and, and help them out. And if they go ahead with treatment, you pay me. If they don't. But that's really cool you because, don't. you know, you said the friction point is you generate the leads. You know, they don't deliver. They say it's a crap lead. You say, well, you didn't pick up the phone quick enough. What, what you're talking about is is, is identifying that or, or recognizing that as your key friction point and mm. looking for a way to fix that, to leave the dentist, the clinician, to do the bit they're trained for, mm. which is actually Absolutely. to deliver the dentistry. Yeah. It takes the pain yeah, point. And, and, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and quite often we've got an associate who sees the patient, then we've got a the receptionist who is kind of taking the lead and trying to follow up with them. Then we've got the principal who's basically engaged us to work with the practice. Mm -hmm. And so there's three stakeholders that are involved in this. And so you know, it, it becomes extra complicated. So it's not a case of, you know, it's their fault or it's our fault or it's anyone's fault. It has mm. to be a team effort. Mm. So everyone in that in that circle, you know, our campaign manager, the guy who's managing the campaign internally for Edic Knight, our account manager, their receptionist, mm. their TCO, their principal, and the associates, we all have to be we all have to be in sync and work together. That's a lot of moving parts. Mm. That's a lot of yeah. moving parts. And people have good days and bad days. And, and sometimes the campaign might not perform as well as we'd like, to, like it to perform. Sometimes the receptionist might be, you know, unavailable or too busy. And, and so it all has to line up. Mm. Uh, but, you know, when, when it works, like one in 10 inquiries will go ahead with treatment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's it, we, we've, we generate seven, 8,000 leads per month. And routinely, one in 10 will go ahead with treatment. I mean, wow. it's, it's, it's. It, it's it's that good basically mm. uh, the typical open day we do we the average practice will get 11 cases in a day wow. so it, it does work but Spanked. there's a lot of a lot of moving parts um, yeah. and you know it, it sometimes and and any i think any business owner is is guilty of this like we, I, i've done it uh, you know at ignite uh, and my previous businesses sometimes business owners just throw money at a problem to solve mm. the problem and that does not work in this context. Like if a yeah. practice is struggling or they want to grow, they can't just throw money at us because that's only part of the puzzle, right? Yeah. There's a lot of work that goes into making it work. But, you know, we've got 100 clients. Some of us have been with us since 2017. In fact, probably more than a dozen have been with us since 2017. Um, the average practice stays with us for 450, 460 days, something like that mm -hmm. on average. Um, so, you know, we, uh, overall, I think we do, we, we do a good job, but it, it, it's hard work. Uh, mm. It is very hard work, you know. Mm. We have to deliver every month. Uh, we, we're not building a, an asset with recurring 
um, benefit from it. We're yeah. not, you know, building a website that's going to get ranked in Google. Every month we start at zero and mm. we we eat what we kill mm. yeah. with practices. Well, yeah. what would you say, you've obviously had quite an entrepreneurial journey with with, with different businesses and now it's Ignite. What, what's the, the one thing that you've taken from your, your entrepreneurial experience each year? That's a good question. Um, honestly, and this is going to sound cheesy and corny, maybe it is. I think... I think entrepreneurship is about ultimately about helping others and and solving problems Mm. or solving a problem. And I think if you can solve someone else's problem and it's a big problem that is very, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? Very prevalent in their life and it's stopping them from getting to where they want to get to, then you've got something really valuable. Mm. Um, And so I think, as long as you can solve someone else's problem, then there's an opportunity there to to, to monetize that. Okay, as long um, as you can monetize it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, my team, like we, we genuinely get super excited when our practices thrive and do well. Mm. I mean, for us, there's nothing more rewarding than if we get an email from someone saying, oh my God, we had, you know, 28 people on the open day and 19 went ahead with treatment. I mean, we have our internal slack goes mental. Yeah. Everyone starts banging out the memes and emojis and people are actually super happy and people, yeah. It, it, so, you know, when we get good results for clients, we, we absolutely love it and it, it keeps us going. Well, that's good. That's good. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's nice to hear because it, it matters to you and your team. And mm. I think if you get people who genuinely deeply care about the thing they're doing, it, it flows through in so many ways, doesn't it? And, and yeah, and, and you know what? It's, it's it's hard to step away from that because yes, we do thrive when when those things happen. Um, but equally, like you know that that um, imposter syndrome is 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 still there. It doesn't matter where you get to, and we're still a small business. I mean, there's twenty five of us. We've got a hundred clients. It's it's a it's a big tiny business or a big small business or whatever. Um, but anyway, it's it's if one of our clients is unhappy or they raise a complaint or whatever. It hurts mm. just mm. as much as it did when we had two clients. Yeah. Like we take it seriously. What could we have done better? What's going on? How did it lead to this point? And all that kind of stuff. And, and, and you know, as a business owner, it's hard to, to get away from that and not to take it personally. Mm. Um, because actually the team genuinely cares. And, and by and large, I think we've hired people that genuinely care a lot uh, about what we do and getting good results for clients. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I think if you get the right people who think in the right way in terms of they bind your culture, um, the skill bit follows. Um, because because yeah, at, at, at a root level they actually care about what they're doing mm. absolutely you, you can't you can't teach that you can't train mm. someone to care so we always hire on culture and, and fit and values first and then skills second i mean obviously it's great if, if someone knows how to run facebook ads if yeah. we're hiring them for that position but you know do they do they need to have dental experience no absolutely not i mean there's a lot of proprietary knowledge that we've accumulated over time that we've we've got a playbook we can teach them what mm. to do uh, but you can't teach someone their values yeah. or their culture. Or like you can't, you know, you can't teach that. No, hundred percent, hundred percent. Derek, we always um, we always wrap up in the same way. We always ask our guests the same two questions. So, the first question we have for you is: if you could be the fly on the wall, uh, dun, dun, dun. what situation would you be in, and, and where and when would that be? Sure. You know what? I, I'm not much of like a historian, so I haven't got like any big uh, <laughs> moments where I'm like, oh, I wish I was there for the fall of the Berlin Wall or whatever. The first thing that came to me, which made me laugh afterwards, the first thing that came to me is like, I, I wish, and it, maybe this is really narcissistic, but I, I wish I could, could have witnessed my own birth. But then <laughs> I realized the practical implications of what I would have to witness and see. And I thought, well, actually, maybe not. Um, so then I thought about it again. And I actually, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall at the birth of my kids again, um, rather than being, you know, um, it, like kind of there on the ground to kind of watch it from from a distance, because I think those moments are just so phenomenal. Mm. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd give anything to, to, to be there and experience that again. Um, That's lovely. And see, my, see myself looking like a right tool. Yeah. Standing by and panicking. Suddenly <laughs> panicking. Go, oh, my goodness. Yeah. A, a panicking, jibbering wreck on the floor. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, looking at yeah, Winston absolutely. Churchill as he's yeah. born. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I think I would love to, yeah, I'd absolutely love to to experience that again. Um, and, and probably... Um, if I could choose another event, it would be to, to relive um, my wife and I's wedding. So we had a, a an Indian fusion wedding in Langkawi in Malaysia. And it was just, I mean, 
we had it, w- it was a smallish wedding for for indian standards and we really 1500 people i assume just two or three hundred then <laughs> it was like 140 or 150 maybe so it was smallish um but until this day that was you know coming up to 10 years this year people you know tell us it's still the best wedding they've they've ever been to oh, and we certainly okay. felt felt that and we, we it was just the best time of our lives uh, we probably shaved about 10 15 years off our life expectancy because we partied so hard oh, yeah okay that's incredible. good yeah good reason so, um, i think it says a lot about your values that the two things that you sign at the birth of your kids and your wedding i mm. think that says that and that thing you're saying about you know making sure that the business is kind of close to where you um where you you live so you can walk to the office and when you stop yeah, yeah when you got out of banking it was to spend time out on paternity leave there's obviously a real strong core that takes you back to family and i wonder mm. whether a lot of that the moving around and, and those life lessons that the parents taught you so young have really kind of stuck with you in a, in a really strong way and it's feeding through to, to your own yeah. family mm. it, it, it probably is mm. absolutely i mean it it's it's why i do what i do and, and I, I can't ever imagine going back to a you know a corporate environment where i'm working for someone else because uh, <laughs> I, yeah. I mean even though the stresses and this and that that come with with this i mean it's it's worth it because and you're in charge you know, yeah you're in charge um and you can you can kind of yeah. you know dictate and determine your, own your course and it's, your sales it's, it's really funny you know, when um when so chris and i bought frank Turner associates together back in 2000 um so 23 years dun, and dun, dun, when we uh, when we bought the business we we agreed on the same thing which is if we could earn the same money as we earn in the city but have more time with our families that'd be an absolute result and that was the reason for it and and i think for both of us the thought of going back into a corporate environment um just holds no, no. appeal whatsoever and it's 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 it's, it's not a money we might have to wear thing. a jacket can you imagine i have to wear a jacket <laughs> exactly exactly wear a tie. that'll it's, be like the end of it you know ultimate ultimate freedom is 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 having your own environment and, and just to say going easy. on holiday yeah imagine having to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely yeah, exactly yeah well i mean you guys are an inspiration i mean you are you know you've been in business for so long you are such an established brand in in this world and and you know hats off to, to you guys oh, thank you no, thank you and to do it together i mean that is not to be underestimated what that takes because that kind of partnership is 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 i mean that's something else really i think so. it's funny i think yeah, you even talk of different sides i i look at guys like you and, and other people who are kind of solopreneurs and just think you're you're incredible because i i couldn't do it without chris and and, and the other businesses we've partners we've got in our other businesses i i i'm not smart enough i don't have the bandwidth i don't have so many things to be able to do it on my own so when i see guys like you who literally have everything that, that comes back to your door as, the, as a solopreneur I, I think that's equally incredible because mm. like I, say, I think it's just a, a a different approach to business yeah no i mean it's definitely hard sometimes and and it's hard to have someone to bounce not not to have someone to the kind yeah. of bounce mm. ideas off of and, and that kind of stuff so for sure i mean i'd love to have a, a co-founder but equally it's like you know it has to be it, I think it's hard to find someone like that. Yeah, you just you're yeah. on the same wavelength. Absolutely. So, yeah, and you guys have t- been in business for 23 yeah. years, which is you know, yeah. phenomenal. So, so I'll follow up. Our last question is: that If done. you could meet anyone, who would you like to meet? Living or dead? Yeah. Fact or fiction? Yeah. Whoever you to you. And don't yeah. Be you done. know what? Well, I'm, uh, this is going to be kind of uh, maybe boring, oh, and no. uh, yeah, yeah, it's going to be boring. <laughs> I think it's it's uh, along the same theme. So. I, I never really met any of my grandparents. Um, and so oh, you know, it's, okay. never, it's, it, it's never really been a, a thing in my life where I'm like, oh, I never had grandparents. But I I never knew what it's like to have grandparents because I never met any of them that I remember um, and, and interacted with them. But then my um, my dad's father was a bit of a legend because he, he had my dad when he was a little bit older. He was uh, 54. Oh, and wow. so wow. he he was actually born in 1900 and so he experienced a you know there's a, a skip generation mm. there, and he, he experienced a vastly different world and that's only like one generation removed you know, you know it's, yeah. it's quite close yeah and so he um he he was a very smart man so so i've heard the stories and he traveled the world basically so in 1918 he went when he was 18 he went to egypt there's a picture of him on a camel then in 1921 he went to london he described what the tube was like it was kind of this weird concept to him these trains are underground there's lots of steam and stuff he actually wrote a diary where he said oh i went on you know i can't remember what my big big line or whatever line it was at the time and he said that you know this train comes with steam underground and all this kind of stuff um and so now here like 100 years on i'm i'm in london and 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 i'm kind of yeah i think about that sometimes Mm, wow then 
1921, he then moved to Indonesia, where he lived for the next 30 years, oh, wow. from 1921 to 1951. And so he, the most of his life was over there. Then he moved back to the Netherlands and he found my, my grandmother and, and married and settled down and, and had, um, you know, had my dad and, and, and two others. So, you know, he, he had a separate life before he moved back to Holland and, 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 and wow. had, you know, uh, yeah. So he's, he's phenomenal. Cool. So what a life. In, in the lead up to my wedding, I started having dreams about him and, but I don't really even know what he looks like and, you know, I have nothing to refer to and it was really weird because i remember one dream in particular and I'm, I'm not a spiritual person or anything like that one dream in particular was so vivid so so vivid that when i woke up from the dream i and realized that he it was not real and he was not alive i was actually i felt like he had died it was like a loss like a sense of loss yeah. Yeah. it was like a loss yeah. and that and, and to, when i think back to that dream it's very vivid and salient, that feeling. It's really strange. Uh, and so for weeks after that, I was it was like I was mourning his loss because it was the first time in that dream that I'd ever felt what it was like mm. to have a grandparent. And it was very salient and very vivid. And then when I woke up, that was taken away from me yeah. and I could feel the loss. Oh, wow. And I, I've never really discussed this much, mm. um, a little bit with my parents, but it's it's crazy. I've never had that kind of experience mm. before. Um, yeah. Wow, powerful. So I would have... I, I would love to meet him. Yeah. Uh, he's an absolute <laughs> very smart. In the end, he got really into like um, astronomy and he basically kind of more or less mapped out the, the, the month of his death uh, before it happened. Like crazy stuff. But anyway, oh, wow. absolute, uh, absolute legend, basically. Oh, uh, I, 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 think, I think there's a whole... It wasn't done all boring. I think, I, think yeah. I think there's a bottle of wine or a beer just on your grandfather, to be honest. Yeah, 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 yeah no, no. So it's, it's um, yeah, that was cool. Brilliant. Brilliant. Derek, it's been, it's been wonderful. Yeah, thank um, you for your time. It's been great. Honestly, I, 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 I never kind of bore or lose interest with people and their stories and no. their history. And, and the business you've got is great, but the story of kind of the who you are and, and how you got there is, is, is remarkable. Mm. And I, I love the fact that your, your family is kind of threaded through this whole, this whole you know, career. Even down to the and Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's no, great. Wonderful. No, we really appreciate yeah. your time, Derek. It's, it's yeah, been, thank well, you. Well, thank it's, you so much for having me. It's fabulous. been Brilliant. It's been like a therapy session. <laughs> <for you. It's laughs> we'll send, it, we'll send the invoice in the post. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Please do. Please you do. You can now get off your couch. You're, yeah, you're yeah, released. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Lovely. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Excellent. guys. Cheers. Have a good one, guys. Cheers, Thanks Dan. a lot. Cheers. Thank you for listening to this episode of Dentology, where we discuss the business of dentistry. If you like what you heard, please do subscribe where you found this episode. That would be amazing. And also follow us on Instagram.